Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to this public lecture, which is um, jointly organised by the Centre for Migration and Diaspora Studies, which is in the Department of Anthropology and the History Department. So thank you to my colleague, John Parker, for helping me put this together. And let me give you just a very brief introduction to the centre. The centre has been going since 2007 in SOAS and I have to say it's flourishing. It's flourishing because of our research community here uh, was doing really a very broad range of exciting work on issues of migration and diaspora. But the other reason it's flourishing is because of our students who are fantastic and actually keep uh, the SOAS community alive. So those two very good reasons why um, the centre has become what it has today. And I'd say one of the uh, interesting or exciting things the centre is also doing is we have this uh, ITN Marie Curie project going, which is about diasporic constructions of home and belonging, and this lecture is a part of that series, so I'd just like to mention that too. Right now, um, my colleague, Dr Christopher Davis, who I'm sure is on her way, <laughs> as, for, as, as usual, um, um, I had a chat with her a few weeks ago and I said, you know, Stéphane Palmier, and I, I wanted to thank her and I wanted her to be here because she was quite instrumental in uh, persuading Stéphane to come and speak to us because I wanted to invite him for quite some time. But I said to Kit, I'm thinking about how to introduce Stefan, and she made this comment to me. She said, oh, he reminds me of that character in Django Unchained. <laughs> um, so after a few comments, I realized she was talking about the sort of the German uh, protagonist who accompanies Django on his journey, uh, the gun-toting bounty hunter who gets killed in a hail of bullets. OK, <laughs> so I thought, OK, back to square one, but uh, we'll come back to that uh, briefly. Then Stefan did send me his CV, which was 21 pages long. OK. So I thought, what am I going to do with this? But just a few basics. Uh, Stefan is currently professor of, oh, there she is. You just, uh, I was just talking about you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. So Stefan is professor of anthropology at the University of Chicago, and he's shortly going to be head of department. So my commiser commiserations on that. Uh, but you can see in his CV that he has numerous fellowships and awards, and he's also written a dazzling array of books and articles and he's taught a very wide range of courses, and what really strikes you are the courses he's taught, which range from jazz to anthropological theory to the connection between history and anthropology. Okay, where, well, you know, obviously that's one of the reasons he's doing this particular lecture. So if we look for key themes in his work, we'll probably find uh, religion, spirituality, its interplay with science, ideas of hybridity, and also constructions of history. And I have to say, it's been a real pleasure to go back and, and uh, remind myself of some of his earlier work. The texts are beautifully crafted, and there are very few writers, Stefan, who can pull off a discussion on the creation of African past, which includes Herskovitz, Sidney Mintz, C.L.R. James, and Sun Ra, Lee Scratch Perry, and George Clinton, and I don't mean the actor, okay? <laughs> So his work has been predominantly on Afro-Cuban religions, and he has also been part of you like of an academic dialogue, which has prompted a move from the idea of Afro-American religions to the concept of African Atlantic religions, signaling the importance of the idea of the Atlantic world. Um, and following the tradition of Sidney Mintz, who actually gave the inaugural lecture for the center when it opened in 2007, uh, he's also helped reframe the relationship between history and anthropology. And I think, in for, for my part, his real contribution to that is by providing a much more nuanced way of thinking about history, really. One example of this in his book, Wizards and Scientists, Stefan traces certain historical processes in Cuba, and he does this in such a way that he brings into question received notions of African-Cuban tradition placing them instead in a narrative of a historical construction of Cuban and Atlantic modernity, which is mutually constituted. So he provides us with a study of Cuban religions and social science in relation to civil and state societies. And what that does is really to illustrate the emergence of modernity and its constitutive hybrid forms. And I would include in that its epistemologies. So it's a very powerful argument of how Afro-Cuban religions are hybrid products of modernity. And... Um, you know, Stefan's he's edited many volumes as well, but I think um, slave cultures and the cultures of slavery being one of, the, I think, one of the most important, <laughs> which signal the shift uh, really to looking at uh, the lives of slaves at ground level and their relationships with their masters. And that really sort of um, signals a new way of looking at the history of slavery, which is quite significant. But I think what Stefan's work does is to go beyond that balancing act. He brings to the fore the subjectivities of individuals. We don't always fit into the neat categories with which we understand uh, wider historical questions. 
quite often the subjectivities are sort of an uncomfortable fit. They can't easily be contained. They're neither pure victims nor undiluted heroes. So the other important thing, just to sort of uh, round up now, I think that Stefan does, is to raise questions of how we look at the debates around an African past and how it relates to the present. Because um, he uses this wonderful example of the fly whisk. And what he points to is that if things look similar, if they look similar in the present moment and the past, we then think, well, they must be the same. And what that does is then help us frame a narrative in a certain way that gives a sort of chronological explanation of how that came to be. But we have to ask ourselves, is it quite so simple? Uh, he raises tensions about ideas of continuity and discontinuity, which have dominated much recent writing on slavery. And I think what that does is to reveal a, a wider anxiety or, uh, about a commitment to or a betrayal of origins, where origins really also hate, uh, help shape these ideas of subjectivity. So the questions of uh, did slavery destroy the vestiges of African culture which survived the Middle Passage, or were there relations of continuity which illustrate resilience, resistance and survival? That always sort of seems to be the question. Uh, the trouble was, as Stefan points out, these concepts required relating an African past to a new world present. And the search for an African essence rests on the construction of an African other who is also understood as authentic. So I think what he very rightly suggests that that's, you know, conjures up a picture of um, our desire to consume the other, if you like, uh, necessitating a sort of separation between subject and object. And also this translation of space into time in order to construct a suitable African past, one we think is sort of a uh, you know, appropriate for our story, if you like. So, Stefan's work suggests that in place of this past and authentic subjectivities, what we need to do is put to the fore ideas of hybrid Atlantic space, containing things which belong to the modern world. So in this particular form, neither Africa nor slavery is placed on the past, but is part of a much more interesting and emergent present. So in instead, we have a sort of contemporaneous African Atlantic space instead of a past and a present. So um, I was thinking about all this, and my thoughts turned back to Kit <laughs> and your comment about Django Unchained. <laughs> because uh, I thought metaphorically, we in fact could see Stefan riding alongside his spectral African Atlantic subjects, a bit like in Django. And what he's doing is helping give voice to very different kinds of subjectivities, ones not constrained by normalized ways of seeing. He too is accompanying his subjects on a journey which seeks to overturn the tropes which normally binds us to a certain way of understanding African-American history. And that is surely very similar to what Dr. King Schultz was doing in Django Unchained. So thank you, Kit. <laughs> So I'd like to introduce Stefan. One word, actually, I, I didn't realize this week that quite a few of my colleagues misread your abstract. So if you've come here today thinking you're going to hear a paper about pornography and its relationship to the spirit world, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Uh, the word is phonography. <laughs> so oh, that's an interesting paper. I need yes, to write it. Yes. <laughs> So I give you Stefan, the Ajama of North Fairmont Avenue, the Wizard of Menlo Park, and the Dialectics of Ensonnement, an episode in the history of an acoustic mask. Stefan. Well, uh, thank you very much, Paro, for uh, you know beautifully nuanced and um, actually, um, to me. Uh, an introduction that you know I find now hard to live up to, but you know I'll try my best and um, and well actually uh, f secondly of course thanks uh, to Kit for uh, making this all happen and uh, and everybody else involved uh, and um, thanks for coming. So let me uh, let me start with a few apologies uh, because my talk today is based on a very long essay uh, of which I can really only share bits and pieces with you today. Um, I also realize since that since few of you will likely have uh, more than a faint acquaintance with the ethnographic subject of my talk, uh, which is a male esoteric sodality known in Cuba as Abaqua, um, I realize that a bit more mise en scène 
might be called for, then I can actually provide you with here, but I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions that you might have after the talk. I started uh, working on matters often glossed, uh, and I'm not quite sure rightly so, uh, by the term Afro-Cuban religion in the mid-1980s. And I've actually just finished a book, uh, do a little bit of shameless self-promotion, uh, which is going to be out in uh, probably June or July. Uh, and that book tries to question what it might mean to do something like study Afro-Cuban religion with all three terms in quotation marks. Now, I did my first ethnographic fieldwork in Miami among practitioners of the Regla de Ocha, more popularly known as Santeria, and started to work in Cuba itself in 1991, that is uh, just about at the time when the really bad times of what the government declared a special period in times of peace uh, were beginning to kick in. Uh, there are several African-derived ritual traditions in Cuba today, and most of them, conveniently for me, happen to converge in Havana, and there are historical reasons for that. All of them have been traced uh, to some oftentimes highly specific African antecedents, but that's not what I'm uh, particularly interested in, and I think uh, Paro said it better than I could right now. Uh, personally, I think that origins are interesting, but really only if one cares about the kind of cultural and political work performed by them within historically and ethnographically specifiable social settings, not as an end in itself. Now, the second question, you know, the, the, the question of what kind of work they do, uh, that's certainly is something uh, that I'm uh, very interested in, but it's not what I will talk about much today. So instead, let me turn to the topic uh, that I would like to uh, elaborate on. I began to work on uh, these matters uh, in the late 1990s, uh, and it concerns, as I already said, a male, secret, uh, male esoteric sodality known as Abaqua. And here, uh, and I almost misspoke, a note of clarification is immediately in order because Abaqua is often written about as a secret society and an African one at that. It is nothing of the sort. One would have to uh, qualify this, but what I would like to say is that it is a male initiatory cult that revolves around a mystery whose secrets only members and not even all of them are privy to. In other words, there is no secrecy about membership in the town of Regla, uh, you know, a, a, um, a formerly industrial part uh, of the larger La Havana harbor complex uh, on the eastern side of the Bay of Havana. In that town of Regla, where I do my field work, everybody knows who is a member of Abaqua and who is not. No mystery here. Little boys playfully enact fake versions of its ritual, and many of them aspire to become what is called an Okobio, that is, brother, in their late teens. No mystery either about the androcentrism. To be sure, <coughs> only hombres and real hombres, not uh, effeminados, can become ocobios. But does that exclude women? Well, yes and no. As in practically all ethnographically known cases of male esotericism, women know perfectly well what the guys are up to when they do their thing. I mean, I repeatedly learned just that, such as when sitting with men <coughs> who told me stuff so esoteric that it made their flesh crawl, all the while female partners or daughters were walking through the crammed quarters, serving us coffee, borrowing our cigarette lighter, and so on and so forth. So, you know, that question uh, needs qualification, uh, that issue needs qualification. And final qualification, a, word, a few words at least about the, you know, African derivation of Abaqua. <coughs> Maybe just sip of water here. Both oral history and documentary evidence indicate that the first chapter of Abaqua was founded in Regla in 1836 by members of a voluntary association of Africans based on some idea of ethnic commonality, legally condoned by the Spanish colonial state and known as the Cabildo de los Carabalí, Bricamo, Apapa, Efi. And here you might want to know that dozens and dozens of such cabildos de nación, voluntary associations of uh, Africans, existed in Havana at the time. Though it took scholars until well into the 20th century to figure it out, the 
very terms Caraballi and Effi in the name of this particular Gavildo nowadays tend to be understood as reference to the ethic of Old Calabar in the Cross River region on the borders between Nigeria and the Cameroons. This onomastic connection and other formal similarities um, have led to by no means unreasonable speculations about the relationship between Cuban Abaqua and similar sorts of male sodalities variously known in the Cross River region under names such as Ekpe or Nbe. Like these African counterparts, Abaqua has eminently law-giving functions and its career in Cuba can indeed be explained by them to a certain degree. For just as this type of association rose to prominence in Old Calaba by organizing the slave and later palm oil trade, so was its spread in Cuba immediately connected to its political and economic functions. Beginning in the 1840s, rapidly multiplying chapters of Abaqua, known as potencias, began to maneuver their title holders into positions as gatekeepers for access to labor at the dockside, in tobacco factories, slaughterhouses, the centralized market, and other economic complexes. By the 1930s, they were practically in control of all dockside labor, directly contracting for steve door and warehousing jobs with international shipping lines, sometimes <coughs> collaborating with labor unions, sometimes <coughs> breaking their strikes, and often clashing quite violently with the police. Now for this, and other reasons, not a few scholars have argued that we are dealing here with an atlantically transplanted diasporic version of Ekpe. And precisely this logic has sent one of them, uh, the American art historian Ivor Miller, on a historical mission to reunite members of Abaqua, Cuban members of Abaqua, exiled in the United States with their ethnic brethren in Africa. Now I have some sympathy with Miller's project, but apart from the fact that few of the Okobios that I know in Cuba seem to care much about such homecomings, the project itself strikes me as already mistaken on historical grounds. For not only did the supposedly African version of Abaqua arise near simultaneously with its supposed New World offshoot, rather the Cuban version soon after returned to Africa when members Cuban members of the association who were deported during Cuba's two 19th century wars of independence carried the association to Spanish penal colonies such as Ceuta, but also Fernando Po, uh, nowadays Bioco, from where, as the Spanish ethnomusicologist Isabella de Aranzadi has recently shown, Cuban ritual forms diffused back to their supposed places of origins in present day Nigeria. But let me now bring these preliminaries to an end and show you a few pictures. And here I must say this is the second time in my life that I've given a PowerPoint <laughs> presentation, so bear with me. Um, <coughs> so th let me show you a few pictures before I launch into uh, the subject proper. And in case you would like to know about uh, Abaqua's current economic activities, I'll be uh, glad to answer such questions uh, at the end of the talk. So let me see how we can... Uh, this is where, according to oral history and some archival documentation, newly landed slaves in that cabildo uh, de los Carabali, Bricamoa, Papa e Fi, implanted the mystery of Eque uh, in Cuban soil, that's the, the um, Embarcadero uh, of, of Regla, in 1836. Here's another view, that's the old uh, embankment, and you know, th this there was actually, <coughs> there's a hydroelectric plant on the side where uh, a massive uh, slave market uh, used to be uh, barracks and, and all that. Now, this is a plaque which, uh, in 1997, members of Abaqua uh, managed to actually get the government to install for them at that place. Reads uh, to the Africans who, <coughs> in 1836, founded in this town the soci secret, secret society Abaqua. Here you see uh, members of the um, Bureau Provincial, uh, you know, uh, the Abaqua of Regla, uh, you know, local dignitaries in the society, most of them uh, higher title holders, uh, celebrating that precise, you know, the anniversary on, you know, they, they think it was January 6th. 
1836 uh, in, I think that was probably uh, 1999. But let me, n let me now uh, you know, get into uh, the substance of the paper. Uh, it has quite a long history, actually. The paper b began sometime in the 1990s when I was working in uh, Fernando Ortiz, the you know, preeminent 20th century uh, Cuban uh, social scientist, uh, you know, really a, a polymath in many ways. When I was working in Ortiz's vast and sprawling archive in Havana's Instituto de Literatura Linguística, because there, I found a clipping from a Cuban newspaper summarizing a report in a 1908 issue of the Philadelphia North American concerning two black Cuban brothers named Leal who had set up a kind of storefront operation on Philadelphia's North Fairmount Avenue that seemed to combine Edisonian sound technology with what Don Fernando, I think rightly, surmised were elements of the rit ritual repertoire of Abaqua. I think it was in the New York Public Library that I eventually tracked down what in fact turned out a quite substantial article on the Leals and their curious sound system technology uh, by which they broadcast spirit voices from their Temple of the Ancient Grace onto uh, North Fairmount Avenue in Philadelphia. Now much like Fernando Ortiz, who stuck the clipping into a folder entitled Negros Nianigos, which is uh, you know, nowadays a term for Abaqua, which uh, contemporary Ecoria Niene Abaqua, that is men o born over the drum skin regard as uh, derogatory. But much like Ortiz, who filed this away under a category that referred to Abaqua, I too filed those Xeroxes uh, of the Philadelphia North American away. At the time, I had just begun my own research on Abaqua and the Xeroxes literally sat in my filing cabinet for more than a decade. I always wanted to do something with them, but I now realize that it was really only on the background of years of doing intermittent ethnographic work on Abaqua in, in Regla that I was able to see the theoretical challenge posed by the simple snippet of information on the rather peculiar practices of two Afro-Cuban migrants in Philadelphia more than a hundred years ago. But let me give you a taste of the repertoire to show you what I mean. Here's what Timoteo Leal, who calls himself a Yamba, the leader, that is Yamba, which is nowadays the highest title in Abaqua. Here's what Leal is said to uh, have told the journalist. I talk to the spirits and they talk with me. See my echo? See my echo? Now Leal seems to be quite proud of his echo and the reporter seems impressed as well. Here's the description he gives. It starts in the middle of the room in a sort of pagoda filled with water. Things let, that look like painted spools float around gaily. A tiny bell is suspended from the roof of the pagoda, and when the spirits happen to be around, they always notify a yamba leal by ringing this bell. From under the water, a speaking tube stretches across the room to a converter. It is filled with wheels, has a glass front, and a bit of stovepipe sticks out on the top. Leading into the converter from the western end of the room is another speaking tube. Still another tube finds its way into the converter from a kettle drum in the east. This kettle drum is made of a china wash bowl covered with skin. A final tube is carried out into Fairmount Avenue. This has a megaphone exit. And it is from this megaphone that the people in the neighborhood get notice that the spirits are busy. Now, what in the world is that? <laughs> and why call it the echo? I must confess that it took me forever to figure it out. But apart from the fact that the article features dozens of other pointers towards Abaqua, plumed staff, roosters, jute masks, drums, etc., it really only dawned upon me when I reread what a woman present in the temple had to say about the phonetic qualities of what she and Leal called the echo. Do the spirits really talk, asks the journalist. Why, answers she. I have been in there alone and the drums started beating on their own accord and the echo made a noise like this, woo, 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 and then I got away. At this point, the scales fell from my eyes. The journalist had simply misheard. Leal and the, women, and the woman weren't talking about an echo at all. They were talking about el eque, 
which is a super esoteric friction drum at the center of Abaqua ritual, which are known as Barocco Surplantis. And guess what? It sounds like or if you like and so to you know to ride roughshod over my own argument what it does is to sacralize everything within its sonic reach you have to have heard it at an abaqua ritual to understand what exactly a yamba leal meant when he proudly showed the journalist his ingenious combination of early analog sound technology with the much older acoustic mask known to contemporary Ecoria Niene Abaqua as El Eque. Now let me postpone explaining what I mean by acoustic mask and point to the irony that the woman says to have fled the scene after hearing Eque's mysterious voice. For that's precisely what the mythical woman, Sikan, failed to do when she first heard the voice of Tanze, an ancestral presence in the shape of a fish that she accidentally scooped up in her calabash when drawing water at the mythical embankment of Usagare from the river Oldan that bisects the territory of Bekura Mendo in the Efo region of Abaqua's mythical homeland, Enyenison. Um, here you see the whole scene about which I will now be talking. Here comes the story. It is the end of a starry night. Enkiko, the rooster, sings on top of the hill where Equinon, the hunter, waits for his prey, bow and arrow poised for the kill. A Kaiman initially blocks Sikan's path to the river, but the man, soon to experience transformation into the Ireme, which is a, you know, a, a spirit from the bush, basically, into the Ireme Eribangando, clears her way with a ritual brush. She bows down, scoops up a calabash of water, but when she hoists it on her head, a tremendous roar issues forth from the container. It is Owon Tanse, a numinous presence in the shape of a fish, who speaks to her in his otherworldly voice. Having been the first to hear Tanse's awesome logos, Sikan is variously said to have confided her terror to her father Mokongo, or her husband Isunekwe. Either or both betray her to the supreme chief Iyamba and the sorcerer Nasako, who had been tracing Tanse's movements and vocalizations, Kama Ororo, as they say, speaking in the center, in the lagoon for days. Equenyon, whose name is glossed as slave to Ekwe, is now ordered to kill her. However, even before Sikan meets her violent end, Tanse is dead as well. His voice has fallen silent. Horrified, Nasako Iyamba and the other Obonis, uh, founding figures soon to become titles, try to revive and recuperate its awesome law-giving sonic capacities. What ensues is a strangely phonocentric version of the search for a male social contract. Sikan is seated on three stones awaiting her immo immolation when she begins to menstruate, <coughs> thus foreshadowing the feeding of the three-footed friction drum eleque, around which the ritual technos enabling men to cause other men to be born over the drum skin will soon congeal. Following Sikan's execution, Nasako fuses her skin to that of Tanse, to no avail. He and the other Obonis will sacrifice the snake, Nyangabion, that had coiled itself around the palm tree that night. You you'll see the snake around the palm tree. Uh, they'll sacrifice Erombe, the Congo slave, captured by the sound of the voice. They'll sacrifice Eron, the ram, Yebengo, the tiger. Nothing <laughs> works. Much blood, Efion, is shed in vain in their frantic experiments. It is only when they resort to sacrifice Embori, the goat, that El Parche, the drumskin, eventually takes shape and once fused to Okanko, the hollowed out trunk of uh, the Seba tree becomes operative, and this is a key term as Nambe Ri, the flesh of the voice. And let me show you uh, this, you know, this is like a, yeah, no, we have, now we've got photos of meeting houses. 
you know what a saber looks like, I'm sure. Uh, what results is a technology capable of transmitting la voz, the voice, across time, materializing its sound onward from Barocco ceremony to Barocco, other ceremony. And this is the moment from whence, as contemporary Cuban Obonequis envision it, an unbroken chains, uh, chain of what they call transmissions, transmissiones, <coughs> of the voice, links the inner sanctum, the quarto famba, of their temples in the ritual exterior spaces called Isaroco, which are oftentimes simple alleyways, to the primal embankments of Usagari, where the sound approximated by the phrase el uyo, that's, that's how they would call it, for it was first materialized in and mediated by an esoteric biotechnological device, el eque. And here, you know, I, you can show you some of the temples so you can see, you know, they're, they're actually, some of them are quite substantial. And here, finally, you see the, you, you see the saber. Uh, oops, we're not getting the pictures. Yeah, yeah. So here we are getting the temples. That's, you know, here's the Seba tree. And uh, right, so we'll, we'll stop here. Uh, <coughs> but Eque itself is only an agent within a larger network that forms as soon as the original 13 title holders of the Tierra Efo now turned into ancestral personae with names designating their future offices, plazas, transact the secret of the voice across the river to a group of men soon to constitute the first potencia of the chapter of the Tierra Efi. And these are two, I mean, there are three main branches. Uh, one is Efo, Efi, and Oru. So reviving the voice is only the first step in its reproduction. It now begins to spread in space and time. And here we can now omit much of the mythological detail and switch to the sequence informing contemporary Barocos in all of their multimediated splendor. Hours of pre-dawn work go into the fabrication, the production, or perhaps better assembly, of the conditions under which Eco's voice can be transferred to a medium that will carry it forward in time and space by enabling men born over the drumskin to perform assisted reproduction in bringing other such men into being. Even before midnight, <coughs> the temple holders will assemble in the inner sanctum of uh, the temple uh, to conduct a rigorous schedule of ritual work. Nasako begins to concoct la wemba and the basic ingredients of la makuba. The former is a cleansing fluid, the latter a liquid conducer of Eque's extrasonic powers. Another title holder uh, named Empego will begin to write authorizing glyphs uh, uh, with yellow chalk on all major ritual implements as well as on the ground leading from the innermost sanctum towards the door of the temple charting the path the voice will travel hours from then. In all of this the physical temple is only a space through which Eque maintains its relationship to the world. The voice itself lives in the waters from where it has to be summoned and to which it eventually returns. To this end, a potencia activates a ritual infrastructure composed of an elaborate network of human, man-made and natural agents. A sacramental machinery designed to conduct, or perhaps better, transduce, a numinous en energy into a variety of worldly forms available to the human sensorium. The altars, drums, staff, insignia, the hieroglyphic writing, even its ritual personnel are mediators that need to be brought to a vanishing point of immediation that is reached when the plazas have once more become the ancestral presences who bring <coughs> about the sounding of Equus' voice. <coughs> and if we had time, I mean, you know, th this of course circumscribes a very interesting uh, vision of, of history in a, in a sense. Now, <coughs> once the fabrication nears its completion after hours of uh, performing esoterical ritual works, obras, Nasako will trace a line of gunpowder along the elaborate diagrammatic firma a glyph that will mark the path uh, for Eque to once more emerge 
and sonically transform the world within its acoustic range for those at least capable of heeding its call. By then, Equignon will step out into the first light of daybreak, announcing the impending sonic incarnation to the profane world. Hey, hey, bariwa, benkama, meaning something like attention, admiration, it or I will speak now. So begins the lengthy chant he intones before Nasako lights the gunpowder and the door of the sanctuary flings open in an explosive visual and auditory <laughs> blast. What emerges from the temple's door is the first stage of La Procession. The major plazas, title holders, followed by a full drum orchestra, guided by the Ireme Eri Bangando, who once more clears the path, and they go out in search of the voice. Only when they return will Iyamba, who has stayed behind in uh, a corner of the famba, secluded by a curtain, begin to apply his fingers, moistened with drops of mokuba, to the yin, a plumed piece of uh, bamboo, poised on the resonant surface of a small three-footed friction drum that is the source of aqueous vocalization. Here you can actually uh, see what that looks like. I mean, <coughs> this should never be photographed, of course, but you know, I didn't take them, so, uh, <laughs> so I, can, I can show you that. Uh, but just like the procession, you know, that ritual uh, uh, march is a mere effect of an as of yet unrevealed cause, so is Iyamba himself, or better perhaps, the human body that has become his office, a mere instrumentality. Blindfolded, he himself only hears but does not see how the yin, that stick in his hand, induces the vibrations on the drum skin that activate Equus' voice. His fingers merely carry Equus' numinous energy over into the phenomenal, that is auditory world, where it will pass through and bring into being further such chains of transduction. From the moment it begins to resonate from within the temple, the drone of Equus' vocalizations notionally both affects and directs every single of the twists and turns of the exoteric part of the ritual that unfolds in the public, you know, the, the potentia's public space over the next six to eight hours. It takes forever. Uh, what ensues is a synesthetic riot that involves elaborate conversations, as they call it, between Eque and La Musica, the drum orchestra, uh, between the Eque and the Iremes, uh, these masked dancers, and you'll see one of them uh, shortly, who though mute themselves, will react to modulations in Eque's volume and timbre in a gestural language of their own. And finally, uh, it interacts with the officiating uh, title holders who will judge from the sound emerging from uh, the inner sanctum whether or not the ritual steps they just executed were pleasing to the voice or badly executed. Transmitted, in other words, to Nambe Eri, the drum skin, by the, the flesh of the, of the voice, by the motions of the yin in Iyamba's hands, Equus' power shifts from numinous to auditory to kinetic, and not just aesthetic, but really ethical modalities. In a bar Barocco Yansao that involves the initiation and swearing in uh, of new Obon Equus, or plazas, into an existing potentia, it is Eque who calls the Irime Eribangando, and you know, here we're, you can see him. Uh, no, actually, uh, who calls the Irime Abirisun, this is not, uh, uh, to deal a deadly blow to the sacrificial goat in Bori, and it initially does so by deceiving the Irime. Attracted to the scene, you can see sort of the another one. <coughs> Attracted to the scene by, of the ritual by the voice, Aberisun shrinks back in horror as he hears Equus' command and beholds Embori, whose body has received the same chalk markings as the uh, candidates for initiation. And just as Equus' voice <coughs> will uh, gain urgency every time Aberisun recoils until he finally strikes Embori down with that cudgel. So will Equi rejoice when the goat's skin, called Sukubakariongo, will finally pre be presented to the waning stars in the early morning hours as the banner of the association. Uh, and here you see that uh, this is a 
good friend of mine, you know, presenting. And he, uh, on the side, you see the candidates for initiations. On the, on the bottom, you see remnants of these uh, sacred glyphs. And you, you will notice that the heads and, you know, the arms and uh, shoulders of the initiates are also marked by these uh, sacred writings. Um, yeah, this is another, this is when he just, you know, this is holding it up to the, to the stars. Eque uh, jubilates when the indissime candidates for initiation uh, are led into the sacred cha chamber and it will give birth to Nu Ecoria Niene Abaqua soon after, when in the course of a series of esoteric procedures, the head of a new initiate is placed on top of another drum called Sese Eribo, which is never struck, uh, and which uh, only moments ago supported the severed head of the sacrificial victim. But now, of course, is crowned with the powerful, powerfully vibrating presence of Eque herself. And I'll show you those. So here you see the Sese <coughs> Eribo. Uh, you may notice that you know this is all of it has references to to sound. Uh, uh, you know the guy is holding uh, the head of a rooster in his teeth. He's actually holding it by the rooster's tongue. So the, there's you know transmission of a voice going on here as well. Um, this is you know enveloping uh, the Sese in the uh, skin of the goat. Here, as you see, uh, the sese crowned by uh, poor Embori's head. You, know, you may notice that you know there are also ritual marking on uh, on his. On, and here, you, the candidates are entering back <coughs> into the. Uh, these are the initiates uh, carrying their uh, you know various implements that you know they have to contribute back into uh, the um, the sacred chamber. And here you have uh, an irime. Um, Another photo uh, approaching with a rooster and uh, doing just what you saw on the, uh, you know, on the announcement, namely uh, cleansing uh, the author with, uh, with the rooster. Uh, so Eque, in other words, has intentionality. It has sensory powers. It takes notice of its uh, surroundings. And it is capable of expressing effect, all the while affecting ritual actors within its phonic reach sacralizing and directing their actions. It is, in sum, a mask, just not a visual one that subsumes the body of its wearer under its power, but an acoustic one whose sacralizing capacities extend to all who know how to experience and heed its call. In this sense, the acoustic mask that is Eque is a complex assemblage of human and non-human agencies. And I think I'm cleaving rather close to the views of contemporary Abaqua members when I qualify it as a biotechnology. One that, while capable of exerting powerful agency of its own, needs to enlist human actors not only to compose its material instrumentalities, but to transduce its mystical energy from the numinous to the phenomenal realm, thereby, of course, reproducing its own agency across secular space and time as well. But enough of that. Let me now return to 1908 and the world of analog sound technology that was dawning at the time. Remember the story of poor Sikan? Ooh, ooh, we might say. Good thing that Philadelphia woman hit the road when she heard El Eque. But while all of this gave me a wonderful opportunity to write up my ethnographic data on Abaqua ritual, I now need to shift gears and try to give you at least a thumbnail sketch of my larger argument. And if anybody wanted to uh, you know, read the larger paper, I'd be happy to share it. In a nutshell, there are two issues that I'm after. And the first one is um, that the Leal brothers' technologically enhanced echo can, I think, be fruitfully analyzed as a site of what appears to have been a remarkable convergence between the phonic and auditory ideologies underwriting the mediation of the divine in Abaqua, on the one hand, and the technologies of acoustic transmission across space and time, particularly telephony and uh, phonography, that had begun to reconfigure Western auditory worlds since the second half of the 19th century. Secondly, I try to argue in the paper that just as contemporary Abaqua's sacramental technologies of sound transmission, activating the disembodied voice 
of the mystery, uh, generates numinous sound envelopes that defy the precisely those space-time coordinates in which you know, the whole thing takes place, so did the rational technologies of sound propagation and acoustic disembodiment of the mundane human voice that began to flourish in the second half of the 19th century engender their own numinous penum pen penumbra and sacramental logics, a process nicely subsumed under the concept of a dialectic of ensonnement that I have borrowed from Jonathan Stern, keeping in mind its splendid resonances uh, with Horkheimer and Adorno. Now, I really don't have the time to go into the latter part of my story today, but let me just note here that both Bell's invention of the telephone and Edison's invention of the phonograph involved episodes at least as strange and macabre as Nasako's tinkering with the blood and skins of sacrificial victims. In fact, Bell's first functioning sound recording device, the so-called ear phonograph, was composed of the surgically extracted middle ears of paupers who had died at Harvard Medical Center and were mounted on a microphone stand and then fitted with a stylus that transduced the sonic vibrations registered by an eardrum no longer connected to a human being into mechanical en energy. And here you have the famous ear phonograph. Bell actually, had, he had an otologist friend at Harvard and he sort of supplied Bell with these inner ears and Bell took them in glycerin up to his you know, summer vacation home in Maine and uh, you know, sort of, well, you can imagine. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, it worked, apparently. Edison's subsequent, and why shouldn't it have worked, of course? Edison's subsequent discovery of phonography has often been described as involving a similar logic of human sacrifice, this time not of the ears of cadaveric organ donors, but of his own blood. As the story goes, Edison was tinkering with the version of Bell's telephone, holding a finger to the stylus attached to the diaphragm, when the vibrations caused by his own voice made the stylus prick his finger and draw blood. Now the reason he had put his finger there in the first place was because Edison's own partial deafness forced him to analogize between different sensory modalities and their receptivity to sound waves as a form of energy. A 1913 advertisement quotes The Wizard of Menlo Park saying, and I quote, I hear through my teeth and through my skull. Ordinarily, I merely place my head against the phonograph but if there is some faint sound that I don't quite catch this way, I bite my teeth into the wood and then I get it good and strong. <laughs> now there are photographs of Edison's personal disc phonograph with highly visible bite marks. Excellent evidence of the principle of acoustic transduction across several sensory modalities that lies at the core of modern analog sound technology. <coughs> Needless to say, the uncanny nature of such merging of body and machine, wetware and hardware, into the transductive conduit of an absent presence, previously recorded sound, was not lost on Edison's contemporaries, many of whom experienced the awesome novelty of disembodied voices as both technological fascinance and necromantic tremendum. As Edison himself repeatedly vaunted, the voices of the dead could now be had on tap. Bell's, I uh, should add, Bell's assistant Watson was actually an ardent spiritist who thought that the spirits had actually invented the telephone and put it at his and, and Watson's uh, disposal. But anyway, surrounded by, uh, as we are nowadays, by things that speak to us, think of you, the cell phones in your pocket, or chatbots, you know, uh, if you want to book a ticket anywhere, we have completely forgotten the fascination from antiquity in the Renaissance onward with speaking statues or other such machinae. Just remember Descartes, Locke and Voltaire's obsession with speaking parrots and the limits of humanity. But while I cannot go into the fascinating history of late 19th and early 20th century analog audio technology, you will want to know 
that ghosts came rushing into Bell's and Edison's machines almost as soon as their existence became public knowledge. Contrary to Max Weber, there is a genuine acceleration of enchantment underway in the second half of the 19th century. If it had taken spiritists almost 30 years to incorporate photography into their repertoire of media for spirit manifestation, the spirits at the Hydesville wrappings in 1847 uh, began to communicate in Morse code within less than a decade of Sam Morse's invention in nearby Rochester and eagerly, of course, availed themselves of the necromantic potential of telephony and uh, phonography in so-called direct voice manifestations right from the start. After all, the very possibility of rationalizing the hearing of disembodied voices that these technologies seem to provide so much resonated with key concerns about transcendence and immediacy that had occupied Western thinkers since the time of Plato, Aristotle, and St. Augustine, that it is not surprising that record companies adorned their logos with recording angels or dogs listening to their dead master's voice. Or, on the other hand, it's also not surprising that ethnographers who introduced the phonograph to people whose, shall we say, semiotic ideologies encompass dreams, possession trances, and vision quests as genuine forms of communication between the living and the dead, human and non-human agents, this introduction of the pho <coughs> phonograph to those people rarely elicited more than responses of polite boredom. So perhaps it was in the Leal brothers' case, who of course would not at all have been phased by the notion that a, of a technology productive of a disembodied voice. That's of course what Abaqua ritual is all about, namely creating the conditions for transducing Equus' voice from one ontological domain to another. And contemporary Cuban uh, Abaqua members go about this in a highly methodological fashion, which they methodical fashion, which they themselves refer to as the process of fabrication, the proceso de la fabricación. Again, uh, I uh, can't really go into ethnographic detail here, but let me note two issues that I personally find quite fascinating in that regard. The first is that el eque is decidedly not just a drum nor even just an object. In fact, as I already said, the term really refers to a complex biotechnological assemblage that includes human actors, animal substances, ritual implements, and spirits that are mobilized in order to enable emanations of pure, timeless, sonic presence. Second, it is Equi itself who enlists humans as instrumentalities of its sonic manifestation not the other way around. I mean, this is quite scandalously abbreviated and may sound rather cryptic, and I'll be happy to uh, talk about it some more afterwards, but if the mystery that is Eque allows men born over the drum skin to give birth to other such men, then it does so in order to ensure its own reproduction over time. Remains, and I'm now coming to the end, one fundamental issue to be discussed, if only in passing, and it pertains to both Abaqua and the turn of the 20th century audio technologies. I discuss at some more length in the paper. And it is perhaps best encompassed by the phrase high fidelity, which so obviously and really rather painfully speaks to the flaws in a Western metaphysics of presence and so expresses a semiotic ideology that mourns the human predicament of having to rely on socially routinized forms of indexical mediation. Auditory fidelity, in the sense, is all about the sadness of a world in which the copy invariably must indicate the absence of the original, unless, that is, their non-identity can be made subject to socially pervasive processes of forgetting. RCA's old image of faithful Nipper listening to his master's voice emanating from a phonograph horn speaks to just this problem. As does, of course, the resurgence of, or arguably, I should say, of analog vinyl records among contemporary audiophiles. But 
are our old scratchy Jimi Hendrix records really any closer to the events in the Electric Ladyland studios in the late 1960s than a digitally remastered CD bought over the internet? I you know, really cannot agree with Friedrich Kittler on, on, on that score. I mean, sure we might say, but only if we buy into a specific type of sonic ideology. One that allows you the luxury of imagining the vanishing of the medium into the message. And that is all but a technological outcome. It is a thoroughly social one. The problem is, of course, germane to Abaqua just as well. And it is one that the Leal brothers would have faced as well, electrifying what contemporary members of Abaqua call the mechanism of la transmission of the voice from its numinous habitat to the world of men and here, of course, the gendered pronoun is appropriate, S by sticking phonograph tubes out of your window is one thing. Creating a sonic envelope that sacralizes everything within its acoustic reach for those who actually know how to heed Equus call is another thing altogether. Just like Bell and his assistant Watson really only knew what they had heard when they belatedly told each other what Bell had yelled over the first functioning telephone, Watson, come here, I need you. <laughs> so even the best recording of Equus' voice might sound like nothing but a weird drone to all of us as we sit here. As far as I know, Le Le the Leal brothers' remarkable experiment, conceivable as it really only became within the structure of the conjuncture of two originally distinct sonic and auditory ideologies, that experiment eventually came to nothing. But what the scant record of it does seem to tell us is that the very technologies that seemed so awe-inspiring, even mystical to uh, uh, European and American listeners, were hardly more than means to an already agreed upon end for early Cuban uh, members of Abaqua. For them, the mystery lay where it always had lain, since enslaved Africans had founded the first chapter of Abaqua in 1836 and had pledged their bodies to the sounding of the voice. It lay in Equus' own agency across time and space. And I think I might have, no, I don't have, I had a little bit of, uh, you know, the, the, the um, could be, you know, could be somewhere else on another, uh, um, another memory stick, but, you know, I had a little recording, and you can actually easily Google it, of the first uh, ever sound recording, uh, it's like Claire de Lune from uh, 1860, and there's a kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you led through a successive cleaning up of, of the thing where in the beginning you just hear scratches, you know, nothing. I mean, it's like completely incomprehensible and then you filter out more and more and more of the noise and finally you get something that you can actually recognize as a human voice. But this kind of technological outcome is not determined by technology as such. It is also determined by the kind of, you know, sort of sonic ideology that we apply to uh, acoustic you know, emanations that we take as indexical of something that in a sense stand be stands behind them. And this, of course, is where the two, you know, where Edison, where the wizard of uh, Menlo Park actually met the Yamba of, uh, of North Fairmount Avenue in a kind of a, as my colleague Marshall Salins would have said, you know, peculiar structure of the conjuncture that unfolded in uh, Philadelphia in 1908. Thanks.